All right, folks, it is 1.30. Thank you for getting here. Um, it's been a busy day. I'm covered in sawdust. I can hardly breathe. But, oh, well, I guess it's better than being covered in tar and feathers. I don't know. Anyway, so um, we're going to continue on with this cabinet build that we started in second period advance. Hold on. I got like five people wanting to get in right now. Give me one second here. I apologize for that. All right, so uh, this cabinet build. Okay, so yesterday um, we did the trim. Let's try and zoom in on that bad boy down we did the drawer trim these little bull nose trim pieces around the drawers okay um so there's other things we can be doing i, I mean there's i've kind of gone all around the the uh oh shoot i just let somebody in and i didn't Give me one second here. I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> That's nothing. That's nothing new, really. I still got people coming in. Um, yeah, Garrett. Garrett. Garrett's here. So anyway, my train of thought. Um, all right, it's been a busy day. Um, we got all these trim pieces on. I've kind of jumped around the plans a little bit. Um, in other words, basically, there's a portion that I skipped, which is adding a top to this with some molding trim around the upper edge, as well as adding a bottom to this. I haven't done that yet. It's not a big deal. It's, I can do that in my sleep. Um, well, I couldn't do my sleep. That'd be, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. But basically, what I'm working on right now is because this is going to be the most um, challenging portion of this build and I was I wanted you guys to see it so I decided to do this next I wanted I wanted my beginning class to see this so now we're going to do this timbre door this roll up door that slides along in these grooves and opens up and then closes so I'm going to pull the plans up I'm going to go over a couple things in the plans with you guys too so you have a little better understanding of what's going on <clears throat> and try and actually teach you something here so let's see if we can do that so basically what we're getting ready to do is this timbre door, okay? It requires constructing a jig or, some, or basically a jig is just something we can use to enhance our ability to assemble something or make a cut or something like that. Um, I've got canvas, we'll glue canvas to the back of these slats. All these slats have a little rounded face on them, which is what I was currently doing. Um, and then you have to cut them off in the table saw and all that stuff. But um, so here's, here's what we're doing. Let's go back to this cut list, okay? So I don't know how much I've uh -oh. What? Somebody say something? Um, I don't know how much I've tried to teach you guys about cut lists, but this is a really good example, and I want to go over this a little bit with you guys so you have a basic understanding, okay? Every single set of plans that you will ever be allowed to use in this shop to make something from is required to have a cut list. And that's basically what this is. It's a cutting diagram. We call it a cut list. And there are certain things on this cut list that always must be there, okay? And there's also things in this cut list that are very consistent and can help you in your, let's say, learning to become a woodworker okay so let's start at the beginning okay first of all you're going to have i'm going to start here at the beginning of the plans um you're going to have or you should have an image or an overall picture of what the finished product should look like that is this right here grab this little handle roll it down timbre doors little racks in here drawers all that stuff and then there's usually some sort of an exploded view like this that kind of gives you a basic idea of how things go together It'll have some little notes and pointing you to certain detailed areas, 
false back panel, blah, 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 blah. Tells you all these little basics about it, okay? And it gives you the overall dimensions, all right? So um, it gives you an overall picture of the, of the project. Then it starts to get into the actual construction of the project, okay? And 99% of the time, the first thing your plans start with should be the first thing you start with. You would start with the sides, okay? Basically, you're, overall, you're starting to build the case. You start with the sides, you start with the grooves for the timbre. That's these guys that run all the way up, curve around, come around the back, okay? Then you've got a couple more grooves for shelves. Then you've got the dividers themselves. Then you've got the false back. Then you've got the vertical dividers that fit in these little dados. That's these little guys right here, okay? Then you've got the timbre stop rail, which is this upper portion here that stops the timbre door from opening all the way and falling out the back, okay? So there's a really um, linear process here that's laid out in these plans, and that's the process you'll follow, all right? We're not gonna start with the case dividers here and then go to, um, cruise over here and go to the top and the bottom and the trim work and then go back and then work on the sides and the shelves and the back. We have to follow this in an orderly fashion. Now, oftentimes these plans will have little exploded views down here that tell you how to do specific processes. Okay, for example, how to route a stopped groove. Okay, and a stopped groove is just something that doesn't go all the way to the end or the edge of the board. It stops at a certain point or a pre-made mark, okay? Um, how to make the timbre stop rail. It tells you the processes of how to set it up. The rabbit size, things like that. Angles of blades, all that stuff. So it's, a, it's an orderly process you're supposed to follow, okay? So one of the things you would never do, never in a million years, you just don't do this. Just don't do it. Don't ever do it. Don't just start cutting up all the parts. You do not ever want to sit there, okay, I'm gonna cut the case sides, now I'm gonna cut the case top, then I'm gonna cut the bottom, and I'm gonna work my way through, now I'm cutting the lift rail top bead, now I'm cutting the lower drawer fronts, now I'm cutting all these other parts. You would never cut all these parts first and then try to assemble them. It's kind of like, if you've ever done a plastic model, like a model plane or a model car or something like that, all the parts are already there. Okay, we can't do that this way, okay? And here's why. <clears throat> if you make a slight mistake or error in your overall dimensions of the case sides, that will have a direct effect on other parts in the project. For example, the dividers, the shelves, the size of the back, the size of the false back, things like that. So any, mis now you may, let's say for example, you made a 32nd of an inch mistake on one of these parts here, okay? And then you make another 32nd of an inch mistake on this one and another 32nd of an inch mistake on this one, okay? Now those three 30 seconds of an inch of mistakes may not sound like much in the beginning, but by the time you get down here and by the time you get to the end of the plans, you could have a real, well, you could have a real nice piece of firewood on your hands, okay? <clears throat> so we follow a, a, a series of progression. progression. Um, we follow it in order, and um, we cut our parts as we need them, not before we need them. <clears throat> All of that being said, okay, I should have already... mounted the top the trim that goes around the top this all this here's the detail of it right here okay all this trim that goes around the top i should have already mounted that okay um i should have probably already made this lift rail right here um stuff like that but i have seen this project built and this thing doesn't want to doesn't want to doesn't want to click I've seen several of these built um, and I know my way around this shop and a way, my way around a oak board um, to be comfortable with doing this. I generally do not allow students to do this unless I recommend they do it. But this is one of those situations where the timbre, the drawers and the timbre door on this project are the most difficult aspect of it. So once I had the case done 
had the main body of the case assembled, I'm very comfortable with go ahead and doing the timbre and the drawers um, because this will be a fully functional project without that decorative top or decorative molding. And I want my students to be able to see this timbre door process. So I tend to be babbling on, but here's where we are right now. Um, this, this project actually has three separate sets of plans, okay? The first set of plans is how to build the jig that allows you to make the timbre door, okay? And that happens to be, I don't know if you can see, does it show a little screen right here that, that shows what the camera is currently seeing? Like, I don't know. Let me see, where's the chat thingy? Can you, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, and I can't even see the chat window. Here, I'm gonna stop share for a second. So you can, you can see it. So basically what we have here, this is the beginnings of that jig that will allow us to assemble the timbre door, okay? Um, so that's good to know that, that uh, you guys can see that little window there. Okay, so that's one part of the plans right here, just making the jig, just that alone. That's one set of the plans. You go to the next page, here's the actual plans for the cabinet. You keep going, and then here's the plans for actually how to make one of these timbre doors. So it's three separate sections of plans, okay? So we're in this section right now. I'm making the timbre slats, and we're getting ready to do this assembly. I've got to make that jig. Um, that's not a problem. But I want to show you guys how we make these timbre slats. It's kind of interesting how they're made. Um, so we're going to stop this share here, and I'm going to mosey back on over here to the back of my bald head or at least somewhere near there and i'll show you guys something okay so these are a bunch of oak boards what i've done is i've thicknessed them to three quarters of an inch thick and i've cut them to length and they are now getting prepared to be ripped to width that's out of order but you can't do it any other way um, on this so basically, I started by grabbing a rough board off the rack, um, drew my parts to rough dimensions. Or I need 40 of these slats to make the timbre door. But I'm going to make a lot more than 40. And here's why. Because what can happen is as you do this, oak is notorious for tearing out and splintering and taking big chunks out, especially when you route it. Okay. So I'm making extra. I figured about 10 extra for the possibility that um, something would happen on the router table that would take a chunk out and I don't like that piece. <laughs> or there's also situations in some of these where you get to the inside and you see these little black dots on this guy. Those are worm holes, right? Little, little wood worm holes. And those will sometimes show up after you start cutting up a board and I really don't wanna see those, okay? So basically what I've done is I actually should have enough here. Let's see, I just cut these off. There's, let me see how many we've got. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, Got 18 right now, okay? I make another pass on here, I'll have 18, 18, 36. So I've almost got my 40. I've got a lot of lumber there, okay? I should be able to get almost 70, 75 pieces out of this. And here's why I wanted that many. We've done this project before, okay? And the plans for this project tell you, or I guess ask you, here's how they make the timbre door, okay? In this jig, we're gonna lay our slats in there upside down with the backs facing up, all right? We're going to have a piece of canvas attached here at one end with a little strip of wood. That's what this little cleat right here is to hold the canvas in place, okay? The ends of the slats are held in place by a rabbit on this jig. Maybe you can see it here. There's a little rabbit right here on the edge of this strip of wood that these slats slide into. So that's gonna help hold them in place. Now. In the past, we have used contact cement as the adhesive to hold this canvas onto the back of the slats. Now, the way that works is you put contact, you brush contact adhesive. It's kind of a, 
ooey gooey like a i'd hate to say it but it's the consistency of a snot or something it's halloween i can say that right um and you brush it on the back of the slats you also brush contact cement they say liberally liberal coat of contact cement to both surfaces so you've got contact cement on the back of the canvas contact cement on the back of the cleats or on the, the timbre slats then you let it set up okay you let it kind of get tacky um, and this is why it's called contact cement because once the glue has tacked up on both of those surfaces as soon as that canvas touches the back of those slats it's stuck you're not getting it back off there that's why they call it contact cement once it comes in contact with something bam you're stuck okay so we've done it this way before and it has its ups and downs it works okay but if you don't get the right amount of glue or enough glue or this or that or whatever the case may be it can be a real hassle we've found um my third period class and I found a video online of a guy doing a timbre door where he used wood glue instead of um, contact cement. And what he did was he took a little foam roller and he rolled a nice even layer of glue, wood glue, just the same yellow glue we've been using all along on the back of these slats. Then he laid the canvas on it, got it exactly where he wanted it. He could move it around and stuff. It's not going to stick as soon as he touches it. Then he took a clothes iron and he started ironing, ironing, ironing the back of the canvas. What that did over the course of about 10 minutes of ironing this big thing, um, it set the glue and it dried the glue. He pulls it off 15 minutes later and it looked like it worked great. We've never done it that way before. So what I'm going to do is I've got, I should have enough extra slats where we can do a test run of that wood glue and clothes iron one and see how it works. If it works well, we're probably gonna do it for this because that contact cement is messy, nasty. It's crapshoot whether it's gonna work well at the temperature we're sitting at and the humidity we're sitting at and all that stuff. So we're gonna, we're gonna try a little test bed for that. So I've got enough lumber to do that. So let's go over the process of making these actual slats, okay? So what we have, I'm gonna get this off the share. So what we have is a multi-part process. Over there, we have a router table with, and you should just, just about be able to see it. I'm gonna go over there and rotate it so you can see it. With what's called a crown bit or a bullnose bit, okay? And it's very similar to the bit that we use to make the drawer trim, okay? So you can see the cutting edge on this right here, okay? It's got a, it's a curved shape, all right? And it's very similar. What did I do with that bit? I think I said it over there. I had it out for the last third time here. It's very similar to this. This is a bullnose bit, okay? And you can see this curved portion here, right? At least I think you can. Okay. Um, that's the exact same bit. This is just uh, three eighths, a quarter of an inch larger than the bit we used for the drawer trim, but it's the exact same bit, just a little larger. Um, that's what we used to make the bullnose trim. And this is a very similar bit, except this one's bearing guided. You can use this bit without a fence in place. This one does not have a guide bearing. You cannot use this bit without this fence in place, okay? So what this is accomplishing is all of our lumber right here, okay? It's built to thickness, has two parallel edges, it's ready to go. Now, one of the problems with a bit, it doesn't have a guide there, okay? Because when I, and that's why, I don't know if you can see or not, but that's why there's a couple playing cards taped to the surface of, this is the outfeed fence, this is the end feed fence. We're gonna feed our material in this direction. So we remove material from this edge, but what happens is we don't compensate for the amount of material we remove. Once you get about right here, the board's gonna rock, okay? Or it's gonna dip into the bit and it's gonna take more off at the end. It's called kind of a, it's, a, it's almost called sniping, sniping the end of the board. So that's what this is here for. That's a spacer so that as you pass through the bit, once you get all the way through the bit, the board's not going to dive into the bit once it comes off this part of the fence. So I'm going to show you what we do here. Um, it's kind of loud, but I'm actually going to put some earmuffs on because this is going to, I've been doing 
doing this for a while and it's annoying me now. Okay, we're gonna give this a shot. <laughs> actually have to, since it's almost impossible to put this the bit height on this thing exactly centered on this board, in other words, where the, where the apex of this, or where the center of this radius is dead center and edge of this board, it's really hard to do. So if we get it really, really close, then we're just going to take the board, slip it in for in, and we're going to make another pass, and it will center that radius on the edge of the board. So we're going to do the other side. <laughs> up with we end up with that radius on both edges of the board okay so then what I do normally um, is I'd go ahead and I'd round over all the rest of those boards all those other boards I'd do all both edges on every one of those boards okay let me turn this so you guys can see both edges on every one of those boards and zoom out Zoom back and go left. Dang it. I do it the wrong direction. So all those boards there, I do both edges on all those boards. Then I come over here and this fence is now set. The fence is set to rip a half inch. Our slats are supposed to be half inch wide, okay? So once I get all the edges of those boards rounded like that, then I come over here. I rip one edge off. the other edge off. So with every trip to the router table, I get two slats off each board. Okay? Then I'll go back to the router table. Once I've ripped all, ripped all those edges off, I'll round them over again. I'll get two more slats and it'll keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? Until we get the slats we need. So, that's how you make timbre slats. Now I want you guys to notice something here too. Can you guys see that gap? See when I squeeze? So this board, so these came out of this board, I'll show you guys it, like this, right? So that's how they were in the board. Just like that. They came out just like that, right? You with me on this? Okay, so I want you to look down this board and tell me if this board looks like it's seriously warped, like it's doing, if it's doing this number or something like that. It's not, is it? Okay. So here's the problem. Okay. When I go to put these together, there's actually, this would be the direction it would be warped. And it's, it's as flat as can be. It's, it's totally flat. But as soon as you cut these off, they decide they're going to freak out 
and create this big gap. And I want you guys to see how much of this gap there is. It's pretty crazy. Hey, I went the right way that time. And yeah. Okay, so the ends of these guys are touching. Can you guys see how much of a gap there is right there? Watch this. See how much, look how much there is. That's like, that is almost an eighth of an inch gap. So here's what happens when you cut lumber. And this is one of the things that makes woodworking so difficult, all right? And that is um, wood moves, okay? Obviously, wood moves with changes in temperature and humidity. That's, that's one thing, okay? But anytime you cut into a board, okay, you're relieving stresses from inside that board. In other words, have you ever, all right, so do any, do any of you go hiking? Has anybody been to Disneyland? Has anybody been to Magic Mountain? Has anybody hiked all day long or something like that? You know, in other words, been in your shoes all day long. And when you finally get home and you take your shoes and socks off, you're just going, oh, thank God. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, that feels great. That's what this wood is doing when we cut it. We relieve certain internal stresses. And when we do so, that wood can do its own thing again. It can relax. It just goes, oh, that feels so good. And it warps. It bends. It twists. It does all kinds of weird things. Okay, so um, that's kind of what's happening when you make a cut in the wood. Now, some woods react much more dramatically to being cut than, than others. For example, the pine we have here, I've seen some of this pine deflect. That's, if you had a six foot piece of pine and you cut a two inch piece off the edge of it, six foot long, I've seen that two inch piece deflect six inches. I mean, just boink, just totally bend, okay? Um, but it, it can really be a problem, especially when you look at this, look at what we're going to use these for. Okay, we're gonna line all these things up. I'm gonna back out a little bit here. Actually, I'm gonna put them on this table real quick and let's see how badly they, dang it, wrong way again. I cannot get this straight in my head. Let's see how badly they've actually um, worked among all of them. I can't move that fence. I've got a lot more of those to cut. I'm going to clean some of this off. I'm really curious because what's going to happen is we need the edges of these slats to be even with each other. We need them to cut. There cannot be any gaps. So you're going to see those gaps in the chamber door. Now, let me see if you guys can even see this. Okay, I'm going to lay them up like that. We're going to see how bad these things are getting. Product in the way. Set them on. <clears throat> and we'll see what kind of um, relaxation these boards have gone through after being cut. Okay. So I'm just going to take this guy. So let's turn this so you guys can see it a little better. And this is what we're dealing with. Okay, I pushed them together. I'm pushing them together hard. All right, so that's their natural state right now. When those boards were perfectly flat, they've been through the planer, they've been through the drum sander, um, everything. And look at the gaps in these things. This is from these things relaxing. This is the effort we're gonna have to put in when we go to glue a piece of canvas to the back of them, we're gonna to have to compress these very well from side to side, okay? Um, we've got, my goodness, this one here, this one over here looks like it's even worse, okay? But there's gaps, these things are like pretzels, man. They just bent all over the place. Don't tell them what's going on. Um, so that's one of the things we deal with in woodworking, not only, hold on, I got so, somebody coming in. Um,
not only do we have to deal with starting with material that may not be flat, straight, and square, but we may go through all sorts of effort to get it flat, straight, and square. And overnight, over the course of a month, two months, it tweaks out, it moves, it shifts, it turns, it twists, it buckles. <clears throat> um, and that's one of the things we have to plan for um, and adapt to and learn how to deal with. Um, all materials expand and contract, even metals expand and contract, especially, um, you know, I used to work, have you guys ever seen those giant wind, turb wind turbines they have up in the uh, Clement River Valley up there, Pendleton area and stuff? Um, those kind of started down in Southern California. I worked on those for about 12 years. And one of the things we ended up having to do on a regular basis was change out a gearbox. And that required, pulling a shaft that was about 12 to 16 inches in diameter um, and getting a bearing off of that shaft. And the only way to get it off was to take a torch and heat the bearing while wrapping the shaft in a cold wrap to expand that bearing enough to pull it off. Um, same thing for putting new bearing on. You'd have to get that bearing super hot, get that shaft really cold, slide the bearing on, and the expansion of the bearing would collapse, it would relax, um, the shaft would enlarge again, and that bearing would be a tight fit on it. So it, all these things have to be accounted for with expansion and contraction. Um, so it's just an interesting deal. Um, it's going to be interesting getting these things to work right. Um, the nice thing is I'll have probably, I'm guessing I'll have 20 to 30 extra slats. So um, I will start by choosing the ones that, well, obviously I can't use any that have chunks taken out of them from the router. If there's a chunk taken out of it somewhere, I can't use that. Um, if there's a wormhole or something like that, I don't really want to use it unless I had wormholes scattered all over the place, then it might look kind of neat. But if I just have one or two, it just kind of look kind of funny. Um, and then I'm going to go for color. Okay. Um, I see one here that's definitely a different color than the rest of them. I'll probably bring that one out okay and set it aside um, and I'll look at color match and things like that um, so then I'll have a fairly consistent group that I'm going to use for the actual timbre and I can use the other ones to test our glue theory and see how that's going to work so that is a lot of talking and throwing things at you at one time but with any luck, you got a little something out of it and you've got a, a tiny understanding of what we're trying to accomplish with these, this cabinet and where we are in this cabinet build. Um, I was hoping it might be a little interesting to you to see something a little different, um, a slightly more advanced than you would normally see in beginning woods. So I hope you did get something out of it. A um, couple things, uh, those of you that get here on time, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. It means the world to me to be able to start on time and not have to keep my eyes pinned to the screen to find out if somebody else is coming in late. Um, that's frustrating as heck. Not to mention the fact that this course, especially when you get back into school and you take this course, um, being on time is one of the things that can really hurt your grade if you're not. Um, we consider this course to be based on mainly work ethic. Um, I treat this course as if you guys work for me. And if you came in two, five, seven minutes late every day to work, you wouldn't have a job very long. So it's a simple matter of getting the things on time. So those of you that show up on time, I appreciate it more than you could ever imagine. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you guys learned something today. Um, it is hump day. We're on the downward slide for the rest of the week. So I hope you guys had a good day. Make sure your name is in the chat window for attendance. Take care of yourselves tonight, and I look forward to seeing all of you guys tomorrow, okay? Bye-bye. I better put that over there so that you guys have a good day, too. Thank you.